Um, so my name is Brown. I'm currently with the um, Missouri uh, Co-op unit, um, but this is actually some stuff I've done with the when I was still at the Kansas Co-op unit a couple years ago. Uh, I see that my advisor now fled the room, um, so I've got free reign. Exciting. Um, I don't have to tell anybody about the rainwater basin in this room. I'm sure you all know. I used to support a pretty complex like network of about 12,000 playa wetlands. You all know what playas are, but they're shallow, predominantly wind-formed, circular, often circular depressions with a clay soil bottom, and they collect a whole precipitation amount of water. Uh, and it's really variable which wetlands actually contain water because it depends on patterns of precipitation, and this can be variable from year to year. Should I hold my microphone a little higher? Is this good? Or? Okay, sorry. Yeah, I'm soft-spoken. I've been told. Why wetlands are very important for wildlife. They, of course, provide a critical habitat for all kinds of species of plants, invertebrates, amphibians, mammals, and birds. And here's some photos, but you saw a video village of a lot more species that you can see in these habitats. And um, together, how I like to think about them is that they together kind of form a complex network. And you can think of that as like that these ponded wetlands kind of function as islands of suitable habitat in the matrix of not so suitable habitats. Um, in this wetlands system, some wetlands contain water, otherwise are dry, you can see they're in brown. And you get these individuals that can disperse from wetland to wetland, kind of connecting local breeding populations, kind of forming meta populations. And you can have colonization extinction over time. You can kind of see that here, year one, you might have this like, frog species that kind of disperses. Can't really go anywhere else because there's no water. But maybe in the second year, you can see it like can disperse a little bit more. Year three, maybe some of the wetlands that contain water before no longer contain water. In this particular year, local populations might go extinct or they're dormant. Uh, and this kind of like moves around from year to year. With the idea that like if we look at it in a longer time series, maybe like a hundred years, that like most of these wetlands, as long as they can be reached um, over time within the dispersal capabilities of like this hypothetical frog, um, they're going to be occupied. And wetlands that are further away are not. Um, so of course we know that there's been large scale losses of wetlands and since European settlement we've seen about like 90% of these wetlands have been lost from the rainwater basin. Due to like drainage, deliberate filling, land use change and increased sedimentation rates and all these interactions. And it's not only reduced the total number and area of, of these wetlands uh, that remain, but also increases the distance among these remaining wetlands. Um, future losses and, and changing climates are going to put extra pressure on the wildlife and the system in general. Uh, we see a continued conversion to row crop agriculture, so that really leads to more direct losses, but also further increase in sediment accumulation. Um, we also see that climate change in these areas have fewer and more intense precipitation events. Um, so this could also lead to increased sediment accumulation in some of these wetlands. And increased summer temperatures might actually lead to like lower overall inundation probabilities overall. And this will have some consequences for wildlife because many species of plants, insects and amphibians actually have fairly limited dispersal capabilities and if too many wetlands actually disappear from the landscape or are like uh, unavailable in long time periods, populations might actually become pretty isolated. Um, and that kind of brings me to my question that we kind of try to answer is like what are the effects of past and future wetland losses? on the connectivity and structure of this rainwater basin network. Um, so our specific research objectives as projects were uh, compare network connectivity between an historical pre-European landscape and the current extent of the rainwater basin network. And also to assess the effects of future wetland losses and identify which wetlands in the system should, should be or could be prioritized for conservation. Um, so for this we use network models, um, it's a useful simplification to kind of answer some of these questions. In this case we uh, see wetlands uh, as nodes in the network. Um, we can link those together. Um, if there's dispersal po possible in this case among these wetlands, we can represent that by links or edges. And we can make these models species specific. Uh, or at least like set them to certain dispersal capabilities. So we might have something that has high dispersal capability like this northern pintail for this case. Well, maybe there's a lot of links uh, of ways that these wetlands actually connect. They can like jump from wetland to wetland. But the same set of wetlands might actually function very differently from species that have very low dispersal capabilities like this chorus frog. In that case, maybe some dispersal between these wetlands is not possible at all. They're simply too far. 
Um, so given these networks that we then create that consist out of wetlands and is the links between these wetlands, um, we can calculate all kinds of like ways to characterize this network. And we calculate those at different very structural levels. So in this case, we can look at the whole network and kind of look at this, um, this network and ask ourselves, so what's the maximum cluster size? Well, we got three in this case up here, and that's the biggest cluster we have. However, we can also look at like how individual wetlands function in this network. Um, so in this case, we might look at something that's called decree centrality, or how we call it, like which wetlands are hubs in the system. Um, so we kind of look at this mostly from a standpoint where we're calculating the number of direct links that a wetland has with any other wetland in the system. Um, you can see here there's a couple ones in the middle that are connected to four wetlands. So you can say that they are better hubs in the system than some of these other wetlands. And the idea is that well-connected wetlands could really reduce local extinction risk by allowing like flow of individuals from many neighboring wetlands. Um, we can also look at something that's called the betweenness centrality. In this case I call those more like stepping stones. Uh, and that is kind of like the fraction of the total number of shortest, most direct paths from any pair of wetlands in the system uh, that pass through a particular wetland of interest. Uh, so if we like strategically move one of these links, we see that now all the movement from the south of the network to the north of the network has to pass through this one wetland in green. And also, of course, all the traffic goes from north to south. And this wetland in green will have a very high between the centrality value because it functions as a stepping stone for most of the network. If it wasn't there, uh, all the connectivity would collapse. Um, and so we've used these networks to kind of directly compare between networks. And in this case, we can look at previous losses of wetlands. So if like some of these brown ones actually disappear from the system. And we can also like, you know, push the system a little bit and come up with different scenarios where we compare future losses of wetlands uh, by removing a random set of wetlands or a specific set of wetlands from the network. Uh, and this has been used in, in a, a large part of the Southern Great Plains by previous uh, work by Gene Albanese and Dave Hocus. And we kind of tried to like use similar approaches in this rainwater basin. Uh, with the idea that the rainwater basin actually has a much higher percentage of wetlands that were lost over time compared to the Southern Grand Plains. Uh, and also has more precipitation. So it's a slightly different system. We wanted to see how that all functioned. Um, so, we have worked on this quite a while, and a couple of years ago, and most of this work is actually already published. So, the first objective is uh, published in Landscape Ecology in 2019, and the second objective is actually also uh, <laughs> published in Landscape Ecology, but a very similar title, I now realize like, how creative we were with that. <laughs> um, oh well, but anyway, if you want to read more about like, the work we've been doing, um, please look up these publications. Um, for time uh, uh, sake, I will only stick to the second objective today when we're looking at where future wetland losses. Because um, it will be interesting for a lot of people to kind of figure out like, okay, well, if we have very limited funding, which wetlands do we actually want to preserve? Uh, and some wetlands are m more important, in quotation marks, than others. And this could depend on the whole set of like wetland characteristics, like inundation probability, uh, hydro period, uh, the actual area of the wetlands and also the surrounding matrix where some of them of course have that grassy buffer and other ones are surrounded by cropland and might see a lot more sedimentation issues. Um, so for this we kind of calculated all these, uh, all these values, we got all this information, we used the annual, annual habitat surveys and the national land cover database. Um, we lost a couple um, wetlands along the way on the edges because of uh, incomplete coverage of some of these tools. But we ended up with like 1,058 wetlands that we included in this uh, analysis. Um, so we uh, assessed all those four uh, things, characteristics that I talked about. Um, we gave each wetland a score from 0 to 1 uh, and then added them all up. So kind of getting an overall importance value that ranged from 0 to 4, with the most important wetlands getting a 4. Um, then um, we also wanted to look at like, okay, well, apart from these characteristics, how do these wetlands score for how high of a, a good of a hub they are and how good of a stepping stone they are in the remaining network. Um, so for this we constructed a series of networks. Um, we did this in R and all the remaining wetlands, we use the centroid location uh, as a node, um, and then we constructed a series of networks 
um, where we allowed more and more dispersal over time, so in steps of 500 meters. So we started out with a fairly simple network where we only allowed links up to 500 meters between those, and otherwise links would not be possible, dispersal would not be possible. And we increased that until we got to a point where all, uh, all the wetlands were connected to each other. And in this case, that happened at 12 kilometers. Uh, and on each, for each of those networks that we created, so we created like a whole set of networks, I guess 24 net ne networks, uh, we calculated a couple things. We calculated the maximum cluster size that remained in the network, and also the uh, degree and the betweenness values of each of these individuals' balance. Um, so we did, um, in this case, we averaged the degree and betweenness of each wetlands over all the interesting distances, and we combined the average scores to kind of rank these wetlands. And this gave us a huge table where we saw, like, okay, well, which wetlands, according to the betweenness and the, uh, the degree, which ones are the best hubs and stepping stones, and um, come up with this whole ranking system. Um, and tables are terrible to look at, so it's much nicer to kind of look at it uh, on a picture. Um, so what we see here is, like, all the wetlands that we included in our analysis in gray, and the ones in red actually belongs to, to the top 50%. Um, you can see that there's definitely they're more centered in the middle of the of the remaining wetlands, which makes sense because they, they do have to perform as hubs or stepping stones if they want to be considered important. Um, we can kind of go through that, like we get more and more selective, top 30, top 20, uh, and top 10%. Um, so you kind of see like where those are located according to our analysis. Um, of course, we can also rank them according to just one of them too. Maybe we're interested in like which ones are actually only the best stepping stones. We don't care about which ones are hubs, only about stepping stones, uh, or vice versa. And you can get maps where you have the top 10% of which ones have the highest degree value, which ones are the best hubs, versus which ones are the best stepping stones. And you can see that those often don't really overlap. Um, as I said, we kind of averaged over all the dis like the distances of interest, but you can also, of course, construct a network that is, you know, based on just one dispersal distance of interest. Maybe you only want to look at um, a particular species. So in this case, you can see the top 10 ranked wetlands for a species that could move up to 4 kilometers. First is a species that can move up to 10 kilometers. Um, so you can see that, like, just by the restrictions and dispersal capabilities and possibilities, uh, you end up with, you know, different prioritizations of certain wetlands. Wetlands that might be important for one species that has limited dispersal capabilities might not be that important for others, etc. Um, I just want to say in this case, for this talk, we have just combined and averaged over all the dispersal distances to come with one ranking for all these wetlands. Alright, um, after we construct all these wetlands and we got their importance uh, ranking, uh, what we did is we kind of wanted to see um, how important the top ranked wetlands are actually, uh, how important they actually are for how the network functions. Uh, so we did, uh, we had a targeted removal where we took 10, 20, 30, 40, 50% of top ranked wetlands and we just took them out and then we calculated uh, the maximum cluster size at each of those dispersal distances. And we compared that to like random scenarios where a thousand times we just took out a random 10, 20, 30, 40, 50% uh, to kind of get an idea about the average response and, and confidence intervals. We also, on the flip side, wanted to see like how resilient the actual network was. So in that case, we did the opposite. We actually had to have a targeted removal of the lowest ranked wetlands. So with an idea, it's like, okay, well, if we would still lose 10 to 20 percent, but those wetlands are maybe not as highly ranked, how, how bad is the network going to be off? Um, yes, so in uh, the next couple of slides will kind of be like uh, graphs like this. And what's going on here? Um, this is the, the full extent, so the 1058 wetlands, and you can kind of see the maximum cluster size on the y-axis uh, and um, the, the maximum dispersal distance that's allowed in the network analysis on the x-axis. And you can see that, well, when we allow very large dispersal distances on the left of the graph, the maximum cluster size is our total number of wetlands included in the analysis. Uh, but the further you go down, the more restrictive you are, the smaller the maximum cluster size actually comes. And by the time you get to like 2,000 meters, uh, the maximum cluster size is maybe like 100 wetlands of like the possible 1,068 could be. Um, so then we add like another component. This is like a random 10%. So obviously like the line drops because we lost 10% of our wetlands. 
Uh, but you can kind of see that like these breaks where suddenly the largest cluster size drops a lot, they kind of stay fairly similar at similar points uh, in, in time. Yes, that's what I meant. Thank you. Um, so when, then we start moving either the top ranked or the bottom ranked 10% uh, as well. So the, the blue line is the bottom ranked and 10%, uh, uh, the red line is the top 10%. And things you can notice here is that moments where this red line actually starts, yes, thank you, um, starts to diff diverge from the confidence interval of the random pool. So here at the bottom we can see that uh, below 6 kilometers, the top 10 um, percent actually plays a key role in maintaining this network connectivity. It drops below the confidence interval. Um, and the overall structure at like these larger dispersal distances actually retains pretty well. This pattern kind of continues if you remove 20 percent, same story, 30 percent, pretty much the same story. Also note how this blue line is, is fast, like pretty substantially above the confidence interval. Um, and at 40%, we kind of starting to see other patterns. We see that these breaks in the network, uh, they actually start occurring at different dispersal distances. So it's not just that we lose a bunch of wetlands, but like these, these remaining clusters break apart like much um, earlier or for smaller dispersal distances than they used to. Um, and we also see that um, the network structure is actually really uh, resilient if you start losing these, these bottom 40%. Uh, and that's the same for the 50% as well. Um, so some conclusions on this point. Um, so what I haven't shown, but what we found as well, is that the past wetland losses have really severely decreased the connectivity and structure of this area, especially for species that have very low dispersal capabilities. And that these future losses of, of top-ranked wetlands especially could fragment the system even more, pretty substantially. Uh, and this could likely lead to local extension populations as well, because they just simply can't get to other wetlands that might be actually inundated. Uh, and also that this at least gave us an opportunity to like rank, put a rank on individual wetlands and have some kind of prioritization, prioritization system. Uh, and this is important because it would be interesting to answer questions like, well, are we actually protecting the right wetlands based on these rankings? Um, currently, and this might be a little outdated, uh, but at that point, 70% of wetlands actually were in protected areas. And we kind of break that up um, to kind of look at like, well, how do these protected wetlands kind of rank compared to our ranking? We see that like, the, uh, um, for, the, for the wetlands that ranked highest in our analysis, that's also where we have the highest proportion of wetlands actually in protected areas. So that's good. Um, this is like, just an average view and we can kind of break that out uh, for different dispersal distances or species as well. Um, so here we have the green bars like 10 kilometers, 6 kilometers for yellow, orange is 4 kilometers, red is 2 kilometers. And we see that these orange and red uh, bars are kind of underrepresented in this category of highly ranked wetlands. So it means that wetlands that are important for species with limited dispersal capabilities are just not really that well protected compared to other wetlands. So 17% means that most of these wetlands are kind of on their own and they face all kinds of perils. Um, so another thing that we briefly looked at was like, well, are important wetlands likely to persist on the landscape? And we kind of mostly looked at that from kind of a, a, like a sedimentation standpoint and mostly are they surrounded by croplands or are they mostly surrounded by grasslands? Um, so we kind of broke that down as well. So what you see here is the proportion of wetlands uh, and again in our five uh, ranking bins with the most important ones on the left uh, and then the colors kind of indicate uh, the percentage of propland in a 500 meter buffer around these wetlands. Um, and we see a couple cool things. Um, for most of you see blue and green which means that very high percentage of propland surrounding these wetlands. Um, but we see a lot more red on the left which means that most of the wetlands that we actually considered important uh, are also the wetlands that are not surrounded by by cropland as much, at least to a lower percentage. Um, so important wetlands are slightly better off, but even in that category, more than 50% of those wetlands were surrounded by 80 to 100% of cropland. Um, so species with low dispersal capabilities are hit the hardest. Um, yes, yeah, I'll, I'll wind it up. <laughs> this is the last slide. 
promise. Um, actually, no, there's one more slide, sorry. Um, I'm, I'm lying. Um, so to protect um, a wide range of biodiversity in the Rainwater Basin, I think like, conservation efforts should really focus on like, preserving these highly ranked wetlands that form dense clusters at finer scale, especially for species that might be able to move up to like, four kilometers or less. Uh, and restore connections among these clusters that then form um, to kind of facilitate these long range dispersal events that don't happen often but sometimes um, to kind of uh, facilitate this meta population structure. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank the Kansas Coke units um, that paid me, the Mexico Coke unit that I worked with, all the Coke units, um, and the Missouri Coke unit that actually like, helped me pay for this trip, I think. Yes, okay. <laughs> thank you so much, and I thank you for your attention.